The 70s and 80s were troubling times for Disney. After Walt Disney died in 1966, the studio found itself in a period of uncertainty. This was a period often referred to as the Dark Age and the Bronze Age. Escape into a world of darkness. This era was the first time the animation studio had to operate without Walt guiding them. Not only did they lose Walt, but they were also beginning to see many of their legendary animators retire, paving the way for a new generation of artists to join the company. During this time, Disney was often conflicted between whether to fall back on their legendary older talent or give the castle's keys to this younger generation of animators. The movies of this era, unsurprisingly, were as all over the place as the studio was. They adapted everything from classic fairy tales to more contemporary book series. Some of these movies have become classics to Disney fans, but many appear to have been forgotten. Are these movies better off that way, or are some worth a reevaluation? Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Bench, and this is the Disney Dark Age Worst to Best. Like always, we'll be starting off this list with the worst films as we work our way up to the best. Without any further introduction, let's get into it. Earning the not-so-great title of Worst Film, The Black Cauldron is first on the list. An adaptation of the first two books in the Chronicles of Perdane series, the movie focuses on the titular cauldron. The villain, the Horn King, seeks the cauldron for its immense power. However, a group of heroes fights together to destroy the cauldron and stop it from getting into the king's hands. The Black Cauldron. Of these heroes, we have the pig keeper Tarin, Princess Islandwe, the bard Fluter, and the creature Gurgi. To say that the production of this movie was difficult would be putting it lightly. Billed as Snow White for a new generation, the Black Cauldron went through numerous delays and changes. Just to give you an example of how hectic it was, the movie was intended to hit theaters in 1980. It didn't come out until 1985. Executives always came in and out, each with their own vision for what the movie should be. It should be no surprise to you then that this is the worst entry in the Dark Age lineup. While the animation is occasionally stunning, and it's refreshing to see a Disney movie that's darker, there's not much to this movie once you get past those highlights. The story's fine, but what kills it are the characters. They don't leave much of an impression, and they're stock. The bard Fluter is useless. Seriously, what does he do? By the time the movie ends, you'll be thinking the same thing. I wish I'd stayed a toad. Gurgi is the only memorable protagonist, but not for a good reason. He is annoying, with an especially grating voice. The only character we can give props to is the Horn King. Soon the Black Cauldron will be mine. He lacks a strong personality, but he has a great presence and one of the most gruesome Disney villain deaths. This is also a film where you can tell that executives had interfered with the product. The film is torn between being a traditional Disney family movie or a grittier fantasy movie. It makes the movie jarring, with the tone shifting at random. Worst of all is that this film's failure almost killed Disney animation entirely. After the film was deemed a financial failure, there was legitimate talk about closing down Disney's animation division. There was a belief that the animation was far too expensive, and the Black Cauldron's humongous budget didn't help. Overall, The Black Cauldron is easily the worst movie of this dark age, and it's not surprising that Disney barely mentions it these days. Wouldn't you believe this movie is the only major film in the Disney canon that doesn't have a Blu-ray release? Next, we have The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Released in 1977, the film follows Winnie the Pooh and his many adventures. What a concept. After our last entry, Winnie the Pooh is a refreshing change of pace. The characters are lovable and charming, whether it be Tigger or Winnie. They're iconic. All you need is to see a picture of one of these characters and you'll be hearing their voice. The animation isn't the most beautiful among the Disney films, but it doesn't need to be. It's just a film about a boy and his friends, and the animation fits this ordinary world. We also love how the characters look like a blend between living animals and playthings. It's a laid-back movie as well. There are no big action set pieces or a diabolical villain. As we said, it's just the adventures of a bear stuffed with fluff. We've been sending a lot of praise towards this film, so you might wonder why this film is second to last on the list. Well, to put it bluntly, it's because this isn't really a movie. The Mini Adventures of Winnie the Pooh is actually a compilation of three Winnie the Pooh shorts released in the years prior. Some new scenes are added to stitch the story together, but it's essentially three separate films in one. 
So not only is this not a traditional movie, but this also means the film lacks a strong narrative. It doesn't make the movie terrible or anything, but it does make it feel less like a proper entry in the Disney animated canon. If you're a fan of the Winnie the Pooh characters or a Disney completionist, this movie is definitely one you'll enjoy. If you don't meet those requirements, then maybe you should look at other films on this list. Our next entry is 1981's The Fox and the Hound. This film revolves around a fox named Todd and a hound named Copper. As the movie begins, they become best friends and are inseparable. However, fate has a much different plan for them. Copper is supposed to become a hunting dog, meaning Todd will undoubtedly become a target for him soon. They reunite after the hunting season ends, and both have grown into adults. As the film progresses, the two walk a line between rekindling their friendship and becoming the worst enemies to each other. The Fox and the Hound is a very different kind of Disney film. It's not focused on fantasy, adventure, or comedy like a lot of other films. It might be one of the most dramatic Disney films ever made. That's not to say there isn't adventure or comedy, but it's scaled back. At the heart of this movie is this relationship between two friends, and it's always played straight. Sometimes the drama is overdone. Still, it is commendable that Disney made a movie like this. However, drama is worthless if we aren't invested in the characters. Fortunately, that's not the case in this movie. The characters are compelling and interesting. Each character has a clear set of motivations, and you understand why they are the way they are. Copper and Todd's friendship is believable, and you'll find yourself getting interested in what happens to them. We also commend this movie for not falling into a lot of the classic Disney tropes. The characters in this film are unlike the classic Disney archetypes, making them stand out more. Even the character of Amos Slade, who do you think is the villain of the movie, isn't really evil. Besides a great story and great characters, we should mention how instrumental this film was to Disney's future. This was the film that helped launch the careers of artists like Tim Burton and Brad Bird, who would go on to create some of the greatest animated features of the last 30 years. This movie is not perfect. The film is slow, and it takes a while to get invested. The plot is, at the end of the day, a Disney movie plot. You know pretty much everything that's gonna happen, and you won't be in for many surprises. However, this is such a different Disney movie than all the rest that we can't really fault it. If you want to see a Disney movie unlike others, this is one to look at. Next, we have Oliver and Company. The film loosely follows the book Oliver Twist, with Oliver being a homeless kitten. He befriends a gang of street dogs who are led by Dodger. Eventually, Oliver is adopted by a rich girl named Jenny. Meanwhile, a street thief named Fagin, who owns the dogs, owes a great sum of money to the loan shark, Sykes. The two stories soon intersect, and Jenny is kidnapped by Sykes. Oliver, Dodger, and the rest of the animals must work together to stop Sykes and save Jenny. Oliver and company, like Fox and the Hound, has a lot of good going for it, but also things that hold it back. The film is generic at times, almost like a run-of-the-mill talking animal movie. The story isn't particularly compelling either. This isn't a movie that will subvert your expectations. With all that out of the way, let's analyze the good aspects. Oliver and Company is an entertaining movie, as cliche and derivative as it may be. The animation's nice, and it has a style, unlike most Disney films. The movies of this era have a much sketchier look, and this film embraces it in a way the others don't. It's rough around the edges, and it fits the feel of the movie. After all, this is a movie about thieves and street animals. If it looked like your average Disney movie, that wouldn't be fitting at all. The setting of present-day New York is another welcome change of pace. There's a lot more going on in the world of this movie than there is in other films of the Dark Age. The city's always alive and busy, just as New York should be. The characters are likable, and they bounce off of each other well. Oliver is a fun protagonist, and we enjoy the relationship he finds himself in with Dodger, who's actually voiced by Billy Joel. This film even has a few catchy musical numbers. They're not as memorable as the Disney Renaissance movies, but good nonetheless. It is Billy Joel writing the music, after all. Why Should I Worry is the best song in the movie, but they're all enjoyable. We rank the movie here because of its role as a precursor to the Disney Renaissance. This was the last film released in the Dark Age, and it almost acts as a bridge to what we now know as the Disney Renaissance. While it certainly isn't as good as those Renaissance films, this movie has many of the same markings as those in that era. It has entertaining characters, good songs, and a lot of heart. With a good combination of new elements and classic Disney tropes, this movie is one of the better movies in the Dark Age, and so it deserves fifth place. In fourth place is the 1970s The Aristocats. In this movie, we follow a cat named Duchess and her three kittens. They live with a rich mistress, but their fortunes change after their butler tries to dispose of them to gain the mistress's inheritance. 
The family soon meets an alley cat named Thomas, who tries to help them get back home. The Aristocats is a fun and charming film that is lacking in originality. The animation is nice and stylish, especially during the musical number, Everybody Wants to Be a Cat. It's a colorful scene with a catchy song, making it the most memorable part of the movie. The music in the entire movie is for sure a highlight. There are only around half a dozen songs in the film, but each is a high point. The movie has a decent amount of comedy and is probably one of the funnier movies of the Dark Age. The relationship between Duchess and Thomas is the most interesting one in the movie. The kittens can be annoying, but they are kittens. It'd be a little weird if they weren't just a tad annoying. The only real bad apple is the villain, Edgar. He doesn't have much in the way of an interesting personality or presence in the way most Disney villains do. His goal is to get rid of the cats to collect the mistress's inheritance, but couldn't he have just talked it out with her? It would have definitely saved him a lot of trouble. This movie is also significant for being the last film released with any involvement from Walt Disney. It feels like a good send-off to that era of movies, as well as a good prologue for what is to come in the Dark Age. While it's not as memorable as many of the other films Walt helped create, it's far from being a bad movie. Its biggest crime is a failure to bring anything new to the table. It takes a lot of cues from prior Disney movies like 101 Dalmatians. Even casting voice actor Phil Harris as Thomas does little to differentiate the role from his earlier outing as Baloo in The Jungle Book. Though the film suffers from a bland story, we still feel there is enough to make this one of the most enjoyable films of the Dark Age. It just goes to show you that compelling characters and a sense of fun are enough to keep a movie going. Securing the bronze trophy is none other than Robin Hood. Released in 1973, Robin Hood retells the classic story we all know, but with a twist. In this retelling, the characters are all animals. For example, Robin Hood in this film is a fox, while the villain Prince John is a lion. We follow Robin Hood and his gang of merry men as they fight against Prince John's oppression. Robin Hood also finds himself in a relationship with Maid Marian. Robin Hood is a fun film from start to finish. There's rarely a dull moment, and has all the adventure you would want in a Robin Hood film. The characters are all great and they stick with you. Even if you're watching another Robin Hood adaptation, there's a good chance that you'll be thinking of these versions as the definitive incarnations. Robin Hood has the charm and heroism, and he's easily one of the more interesting Disney protagonists of this era. Prince John is an entertaining villain. He's not threatening or intimidating, but he's still a lot of fun. He's cowardly, which makes for a great foil to how charismatic Robin Hood is. Even the side characters are a ton of fun, whether Sir Hiss or the rooster, Alan Adale. We also have to give props to the decision to turn all the characters into animals, which makes the movie stand out in a sea of Robin Hood adaptations. If this film was just a straightforward retelling of the original Robin Hood story, what would have really set it apart from other animated Robin Hood movies? Having all the characters be critters goes a long way in giving the film a vibe unlike any other adaptation. While we greatly enjoy this movie, we do have a few gripes about it. There are some obvious instances of animation being reused, most famously the scene which recreates a moment from Snow White. If you've seen the movie, you know exactly what we're talking about. In addition, Phil Harris plays yet another character that sounds just like Baloo. In this case, it may actually be worse, as his character in this movie even looks like Baloo. Thankfully, once you get past those flaws, this is easily one of the most fun movies of the Dark Age, and it's definitely worth checking out. We're giving the Silver Trophy to 1986's The Great Mouse Detective. Based on the Basil of Baker Street books, the film is essentially Sherlock Holmes but with mice. The story revolves around the detective Basil and his friend Dawson. They go on an adventure to save a toy maker after his daughter asks for their help. The trail takes them all the way to the nefarious Radigan, who plans on using the toy maker for his own evil purposes. Want to know why we rank this movie so high? Five words. John Musker and Ron Clements. If those names don't ring a bell, then maybe their work does. They gave us films like The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and Moana. This was their directorial debut, and it has all the charm the duo would put into their future Disney movies. The Great Mouse Detective is a breath of fresh air in the Dark Age. It was the first film released after The Black Cauldron almost destroyed the studio, showing that Disney was still capable of delivering fantastic animated features. The story in this movie isn't the most unique. Still, the setting of 19th century London, alongside its elements of mystery, definitely gives the movie a fresh vibe. The characters are all enjoyable, especially the villain Radigan. Unlike many of the other villains in the Dark Age, he has a presence, and Vincent Price is glorious in the role. 
he always dreamed of playing a Disney character, so the role fits him like a glove. There are even a few exciting set pieces. The final battle between Basil and Radigan and a clock tower is exciting and tense, unlike similar scenes in previous movies. It's even a tad more vicious than most action scenes in these movies, and you get the sense that Radigan is a dangerous foe. This film doesn't do anything new or unique, but it doesn't need to. It was the movie Disney needed at the time. It's fun, adventurous, and charming, and that's all it needs to be. Let's not forget that it showed the world that Disney could still make great movies after many had written them off. If this movie didn't work out, it's likely that the Disney we know today would not exist. Overall, The Great Mouse Detective is an underrated gem in the Disney canon, and one to check out if you haven't done so already. The gold trophy goes to The Rescuers. The film was released in 1977 and focuses on the mice Bernard and Bianca. Bianca is a member of the Rescue Aid Society, while Bernard acts as a shy janitor to the organization. The two are put together by the group to save Penny, a girl abducted by the jewel thief, Madame Medusa. She uses Penny to retrieve the Devil's Eye, the world's largest diamond, and it's up to Bernard and Bianca to save her from her abductor. The Rescuers is above all the other Dark Age films because it's the most complete film. It has heart, comedy, adventure, a compelling story, and they all blend well. All the other films struggle in at least one of those areas, but this film excels in all of them. The relationship between Bernard and Bianca is interesting. While you do get the sense that they are romantically involved by the end of the movie, they never draw attention to it. Though it's not done in the way of a traditional Disney love story, the romance is natural and real. The orphan Penny is another great character, and you get attached to her. You sympathize with her and want her to get out of her dire situation. The villain, Madame Medusa, is another great villain. She's certainly one of the nastier Disney villains, with how frequently she endangers Penny's life. Sure, Maleficent is evil and all, but Medusa has no problem aiming a gun at a child. Yeah, she's that bad. We also really enjoy the art direction in this movie. When most people think of Disney, they think of bright and beautiful colors. That isn't the case in The Rescuers, which might be one of their darker looking films. The colors are all flat and muted, and the locations range from the bayou to a pawn shop. It's an excellent decision that makes the movie stand out more from its predecessors. In conclusion, The Rescuers is without a doubt the best film in this dark age for Disney. Even animators Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson, two of Disney's nine old men, believe it was the best movie they made without Walt. Now, what does that tell you? Alright, that's the list! But let us know in the comment section which is the best and worst movie to come out in the Disney Dark Age, and tell us what we should cover next. Be sure to check out some of our other Disney-era rankings too. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge more of our videos. But most importantly, stay wicked. Thank you.